Hello, everyone. I'm standing here before you today, and I'm just going to dig into what it is that I have in my heart immediately, like no anything else except to tell you that today I feel like I'm not standing in front of you to bring you a teaching. I'm standing in front of you to, sh in front of you to share a testimony because I definitely have not attained or processed or yet completed what I'm talking to you about. But it is such a burning conviction in my heart that we have forgotten the significance of surrender. We've forgotten how powerful surrender can be. Um, and so when I was scheduled to preach, I was asked, what do you have in your heart? And it just was easy. I knew this is what it is. And so I, I want to bring surrender and the significance of surrender to you this morning, not as an academic suggestion or not as another qualification of theological knowledge but as an experiential process that I believe we need to really build our skill on. I think that oftentimes we think about surrender and we think about it, about it as something nice that happens every now and then only when you're at the end of your rope or only when it's truly necessary do you have to surrender. And so I'm sure that if we'd gone around and asked, give me the first thing that pops into your mind when you think about surrender, I'm sure that many of you, and maybe you'll be bold enough to share this moment with me, like as if it was just us talking, and if I would ask you, what comes to mind when you think surrender? The first thing would be, right? Are you seeing the gun point? Are you seeing the hands up surrender moment? Right. And so as soon as we think about that, you have to start thinking about what is it that you are surrendering to? But in our lives, the things that we negotiate with, the things that we think of is, what are the things that I should be surrendering? <laughs> And so when you're faced with a greater authority or a greater power, like, for instance, a gun, it's easy to surrender. But we tend to be putting the stuff in front of our faces to such an extent that we forget about what is standing behind that, asking us to surrender when God comes and says, lay down all the stuff that's getting between you and me. Surrender all of that to me and just be with me. And then we start negotiating. And that's what we're going to wrestle through this morning. Pray with me. Lord, I thank you. I thank you that you would not introduce a topic to us that is not a good one. That you would not have us spend time, energy, life on. If it's not for our benefit and our good, and if it doesn't bring greater acknowledgement and establishing of your kingdom and your name. Thank you, Lord, that you are not a God that messes with us, but that you are a God that is real and honest and true. And that in all of this and through all of this, your only desire is for us to be with you and for you to be with us. Since the beginning of the first breath of Adam and Eve, that was your desire. Jesus' last breath, that was your desire. And may every one of our last breaths be about that. Us in you and you in us and nothing in between. In Jesus' name, amen. I think I've preached my message in that prayer. <laughs> but if you like, maybe we could journey and unpack this a little bit more so that we can try and together get to a space where the specific thing that I believe that Holy Spirit might have been tugging on your heart in whatever weeks and months before, maybe there are some things that you awkwardly find between you and God when He comes in for a hug. <laughs> I was um, in South Africa only just last week. It was a beautiful time. I'm sure I'll share more about the significance of that at a later time. But in my process and my journey of traveling there, um, my mom and them, when I got there, was showing me this new television program that they'd seen. I, I'm sure it's on Netflix. It's called Very British Problems. And it's about the British and how they have very British problems. But the more I, I looked at this program with them, they, I watched two episodes with them while I was just relaxing at my mom's house. Isn't that just the best place to be in the world? Your mom's house remains the best. So I'm relaxing with my mom and them, and we're watching this. And one of the episodes is about the awkwardness and the big problem that it is to have to say hello to someone. So how do you say hello to someone? Like, do you stretch out the hand? Because what if they have hand germ stuff issues, right? So don't stretch out the hand. What if you come in and just, like, nod, you know, but then, like, you know, 
And I realized that throughout this whole episode, and you can go watch it, I am telling you the truth, the Brits actually confess and acknowledge that they just don't like people in general, and they don't like talking to them, and if they could avoid it at all costs, then they would. And so the whole awkwardness, now the greatest of all of these awkwardnesses, is when you stretch out a hand, and they come in for the hug, and you're stuck with the arm kind of in between, right? Now, escalate that picture, escalate that feeling in your mind, start picking up some things. I was thinking this morning as an illustration to bring some things, and I just thought there's no way that I could possibly bring enough things to make it as awkward as I would like it to be, so you need to use your imagination. It's hard these days, but you can do it. Imagine the things in your life that's important to you, and load it all onto your body, and then imagine having to say hello to someone and hug them with all the stuff in between you. It won't be a hug. It will just be awkward. It won't be an embrace. And let's just say you will not get to intimacy anytime soon until what? Until you put stuff down. And so we're going to circle around this the whole morning (laughs) until whatever it is that you need to spark the thing that you need to put down happens this morning. And so as we journey through this and I was, I was aware of the fact that we were going to be singing Cornerstone. Um, and just in the prayer meeting this morning, Stephen came to me and we spoke about that. I think it's the third verse, I think, where it says, when Jesus comes back, it says, may I then in him be found. In him be found. So when it comes to our relationship with God and about the future that he sees for us, it's not even just a handshake or a nod, or an embrace. It is in each other. It is within who he is, and it is him within who we are. And so then when you think about surrendering stuff that you've added on and that you're carrying and that you think is important, then all the more we need to be aware of the fact that significant, how significant the skill of surrender is. Because let me tell you, I don't want it on that day be found under a heap of all kinds of things that I thought was good ideas. Even if it is memory verses pasted to my forehead and a whole lot of theological thesauruses of different dictionaries of strategies and philosophies, and I'm so qualified with my entire library of knowledge that I've forgotten who he is. I've forgotten who he is to me. Oh, may I then in him be found. Dressed in what? in his righteousness alone, and faultless stand before the throne. And so when we think about that faultlessness, at the same time, we could be loading onto ourselves habitual sins. Unfortunately, we can. We can get into the rut of that becoming something of who we are. We become confident in our identity of being someone that struggles with, fill in the blank. I'm someone that struggles with whatever it is. And so this morning, I really feel like as we look at a couple of heroes in the Bible, it'll help us to maybe identify a couple of things inside of ourselves that we could be surrendering. These are all stories of people that got to the end of their rope. And if you look at the names on the screen right now, I have to be honest with you and tell you that my Bible knowledge is not phenomenal. But those are maybe just a few. Because every single book that I looked at in preparing this message gets every single character in the Bible to a point of surrender. Jonah should have been on there. (laughs) Mary should have been on there. There are so many characters that I can, I mean, my mind just goes when I think about the amount of characters that should have been on that screen. But maybe you identify with just one of them. You have to identify with Jesus because he's Jesus. But think about the other. Think about the other for a second. Think about the situations that they were in, that they had to surrender. And so Abram was one of the first ones. Sarah, Sarah surrendered in timing. She was wanting to get pregnant. She was wanting to have a son, and she had to wait for it. And as she waited for it, she she didn't want to surrender the process. But then when the man of God, the angel, comes and tells her that she will, she literally laughs in his face in doubt and disbelief. She would not surrender the impossibility And then when she decides to laugh the second time and she believes that she surrenders her disbelief and it starts a cycle of fruitfulness. 
and not just a little bit of fruitfulness because we read about Abraham and we read about his descendants. And you have you heard the biblical references and the amount of times that we speak about the God of Abraham is where it starts. It started in disbelief. It started in, I won't surrender my way. You're not going to make this work for me. This is too hard. I don't think this is going to work out. And when she surrendered her disbelief, here we go, generations to this day, mentions Abraham. And then um, we read um, Hebrews 11, where these heroes of the faith is listed. And this week, Renee posted on Instagram, and she posted the scripture, and I just thought, yes, this is it, Right? Abraham surrendered the unknown of a whole new arena that he was walking into. He surrendered everything that was familiar to him. He had to surrender everything that he'd built skill on. He had to surrender everything that was, that was his. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would rather rece- later receive as he, his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country, I know the feeling. He believed, he, he lived in tents, and, and as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of what? Of the same promise. Do you see the pattern between Sarah and Abram's story? When we surrender our disbelief, God comes into the picture, and he then is the one that says, I come, I become the architect, I become the builder of the season or the place that you're walking into. We think about Noah surrendering in the coming flood and the unknown. There is never such thing as a boat or a flood in that context. (laughs) I'm building a boat on my front lawn. Come on. He must have surrendered every single bit of self-worth that he had in that process. Surrendering what you think you are. Surrendering what you think you're qualified in for something so strange. And yet knowing there's something about God in this. We can go and look at Moses. Moses surrendering at the, the Red Sea. Moses needed the enemy breathing down his neck before he truly surrendered. <laughs> but then at the same time, he was met with the parting of the sea, and he walked through an entire nation on dry ground. Now remember, this is very important. Jacob surrenders his very identity. Jacob's meaning of his name was supplanter, schemer, right? Liar, negotiator. That's who Jacob was. And he was fine with being that until he got to a point where he realized and recognized that there was so much more to his life than just that. And we read the story of Jacob wrestling, wrestling with what seems at the beginning of this wrestling match or fight to just be a man. But then he recognizes that it's way beyond a man that he is wrestling with. He is negotiating. He is laying down. He is literally fighting through his very own identity. And at the end of this wrestling match, we pick up where Jacob and this man has a little bit of a dialogue. And we pick up Genesis 32, verse 27 to 29. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. And Jacob said, hold on. As you say that, as you ask me to surrender this thing, I recognize who you are now. Now, this might be a a big stretch for your mind to make in this moment, but just think about it in your own life. How many times have you been scheming or negotiating with things in your life. And then when the Lord shows up in your life and he goes, okay, let's wrestle through this issue. Let's start talking about this thing. And as you talk to him about it, as you wrestle through it, as you really work this thing, as you go through it with him and you recognize, oh my goodness, it's God speaking to me. (laughs) This is not just another good idea. This is not just another life coaching tool. This is the Lord speaking to me about letting go of something that I thought was all about me, but it has nothing to do with me. There is so much more than what we see in the wrestling of God. There is so much more that he has for us to give than things. We're not negotiating saying, I'll give you this, you give me that. We're negotiating and we're wrestling and we're laying down in surrender for what? To see him for who he truly is. Jacob recognizes him and goes, oh, well, if this is who I've been wrestling with, then I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Try and make that 
personal in a, in a surrender. I, I remember just a week ago, the one thing that I'll tell you is about me getting on an airplane and going back to a place where I was recognized. <laughs> going back to a place where I walked into a room and people knew who, we were, who I was. People know what I stand for. They know all about me. And in the time of getting on the plane and going back there, the Lord only spoke to me about giving all of that back to him and not expecting him to give it to me again. I went back to South Africa to lay down my calling, to lay down my purpose, to lay down what I thought was my destiny, to lay down what I thought was my name. And he was very clear with me that I might not get it back. And so I'm, I very well this morning might be preaching my very last message to y'all, to all y'all. Just got to get that in there for, in case it is my last time. But it was tough. Because since I was, I was saved when I was 15, I started preaching. It was part of who I am. When I recognized who he was, I took up my new name and I started living it. And all of a sudden, he comes and he says, give it all back to me. Give it all back to me. Your calling, your destiny, your purpose, what you're good at, what you're not good at. Praise the Lord for that. Everything, give it back to me. And I'm going, oh, what are you going to give me in return? Silence. I'm going to give you my name. I'm going to give you a relationship with me. I'm going to give you me. Well, now... Mm. Can, I, can I just keep this one thing? And, and then we start negotiating with things that we think is really good. Like, can I just remain the same kind of mom that I am? You know, because that's a holy, sacred thing. I'm a mom. I'm a mom. Can I just remain, you know, the wife to a legendary, awesome, godly man? Oh, my my, my voice trembles in the knowing of the authority and the awesomeness of him. He's listening, that's why I'm saying. <laughs> Can I just remain this? Can I just hold on to that? And then all the more I started seeing this picture while sitting in between two huge men on the plane there and on the plane back. It was a grueling travel. I had to surrender my comfort. I, it just, he challenged me on surrendering every little thing that I thought was who I am, until I literally felt like, Lord, is there anything more you can challenge me with giving away? And then he said to me, give me 512. No, Lord, not the dream of Austin being transformed. (laughs) No, Lord, not that. And then I saw this post that Renee posted. And I realized it's the same thing. It's all one and the same thing. Abram gave to God. He surrendered to God, not for what he could get in return, but because of who God is. And because he didn't want anything to be in between him and the intimacy of the embrace of the Father. And so we can go on with Daniel in the fire, Esther surrendering in the protocol and approaching the king, and then Job. Job surrendering, even though everything had been taken from him. I'm not even going to read the whole scripture, but he just basically speaks about, Lord, there is nothing left in my life. My children are gone. Everything that I owned is gone. I've pretty much lost everything. And what's really significant in the scripture is that Job does something right. He surrenders in worship. He doesn't just surrender for the sake of surrendering, but he surrenders in acknowledging who God is. And he surrenders and not just acknowledging that God is bigger than him and stronger than him and he's kind of a little scared of him. But he surrenders in knowing that even though it doesn't seem like there's anything good left in his life, he knows that God is good. And so if he knows that it's God asking him to surrender the stuff, then he'll do it. Only just because God is good. Not because of the stuff, the good stuff. David surrenders his heart. And this took it to a whole nother level for me. Because I was thinking about purpose, and I was thinking about destiny. I was thinking about calling. I was thinking about functioning. I was thinking about my job. I was thinking about my potential. I was thinking about all these things to surrender to God. I was thinking about sins that I need to confess and surrender to Him. All these things that I've added onto my life, I was thinking about all of that. 
but I didn't really think about my emotions and how I feel in essence. And who have I, who have I invited into my heart and allowed them to stand between me and my priority of the presence of God? Are there people like that in your life that maybe you need to surrender? That maybe you need to say, God, I cannot be in, in control of these people's well-being. I need to give them to you. I need to trust you that they'll be okay. I need to trust you that you'll look after their destinies. I don't need to make their destinies happen. I'm looking at Donna as a mom, and I'm thinking, we really know that feeling. Giving your children, giving your husband, giving your friendships, giving your relationships, giving your church people, family, precious ones, saying, I'm going to give them all back to you, Lord. Jesus surrenders his final breath. He surrenders to the very core that there's not even anything left of life within him. Mark 15, verse 37 to 39 says, But Jesus uttered a loud cry. He was on the cross and breathed out his last, look at this, his last voluntarily, sovereignly, dismissing and releasing his spirit from his body in submission to his Father's plan. And the veil of the Holy of Holies of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom, from heaven to earth. When the centurion who was standing opposite him saw the way that he breathed his last, being fully in control, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. Surrender, in essence, is to cease resistance, to willingly submit to authority, to yield in honesty what you are carrying in your heart, and to lay down what you are holding in your hands. Jesus was holding the eternal destiny of the entire mankind in his hands when his father said, give them to me. And he did it. And he did it in a way and at a time that he had no guarantee of what the outcome would be. I mentioned that surrender is not a transaction and I just want to mention this one thought to you. I, I joked about the British problems and the handshake and the nod and the hello and then the embrace and then having all this stuff between us, right? I mentioned that. But can you really just picture your relationship with God for a second? And if you could imagine that, that day that we'll be, we'll be with him and we'll be faced with him, can you imagine thinking that the things that you have laid down, like lying all around his feet, like, is it about the things that you're surrendering for him? Is he going to keep all of that like a treasure? Or is he going to, like, put it out on a display? And then one day when you get to heaven, you go, he's going to go, oh, thank you so much for surrendering your skill. Really needed that. Come on. He does not need anything. And for me, in this process, I realized he does not need anything from me. if you think for one second that you're that important, <laughs> then maybe I can release you from that pressure and you can surrender that importance this morning as well. <laughs> because then we can live freely and lightly without this pressure of you have to perform, you have to be this, you have to be this perfectly holy Christian, this, oh, I'm mature. I'm a mature Christian. I live in wisdom. And I can keep other people accountable to the scriptures because I know it so well, lay it down. Lay it all down. Get rid of it all so that it's just who he says you are and you. So there's just his opinions that's left and you. I'm an extrovert, and I just have to tell you that this mic thing is really, really irritating. Lord, I surrender my irritation. <sighs> So in this process, I remember texting Yuri, and as I started surrendering things that the Lord was convicting me about, right, one after the other things that he would show me, he would show me Josh's destiny. Lord, I give it back to you. I'm not going to try and train that boy to be what I think he should be. I'm going to try and keep on surrendering him to you. Haven't I messed up the sound? People on the live stream, I'm sorry. Okay, so as he starts telling me about all these things, I'm on the plane, one after the other, very uncomfortable flights. And I start 
doubting God's goodness because, you see, he's just taking all all the stuff away from me. Think about the characters that we mentioned in the beginning. They were all at the end of their rope. Do you think they were smiling while they were surrendering? So as we think about the things that we're surrendering, I want you to kind of consider that it might not be a fun process. And because it's not a fun process, we start then measuring God's goodness rather than looking at the things that we've loaded onto us to make his goodness so murky. We've made what his goodness looks like stuff rather than what his goodness looks like a relationship with him in absolute intimacy and blind trust. And so we load these things on, and as soon as he starts saying, give that back to me so you don't have to carry it anymore. Give this back to me so I can just totally obliterate this, this lie, this nonsense, this opinion, this pressure that you're putting on yourself. Give all of this back to me, and as I take it, I want you to be aware of the fact that I am good. And so I'm flying, and I'm negotiating these things, and I remember texting, God, uh, texting Yuri and saying, I am sure that the favor and blessing of God has been removed from me. This process is just him making sure that I give everything good back to him so that I have nothing left in the end and then he'll be done with me. Sounds a little like Job, don't you think? Sounds a little like Daniel, don't you think? Sounds a little like Sarah, don't you think? So maybe I could be as bold as go around the room and mention your names (laughs) and say it sounds a little bit like And now no one's making eye contact. (laughs) Surrender is not a transaction. It's a process. But at the same time, I'm trusting this morning that we will become skillful at it. That when he mentions the things that we need to surrender, that we'll go, I know how this works. And so I want to suggest a couple of things that could maybe help us to get better and better and better at it. And I know that for us, this might seem like, how do I get better at a skill? How do I work it? It kind of makes me think of sport and an exercise and like working on a skill or getting better and better. You exercise. And then the second thing that happened as I started thinking about exercising the skill of surrender, like laying down, getting better at it, I started thinking about sport and how you need to practice and get better and better at sports. And as I was thinking about sports and getting better and better at a skill, I thought about Hebrews 12 verse 1, because the sports heroes of the Bible is in there. And so it speaks about the heroes of the faith, the guys that worked on the skill of believing God more than what they believed their current reality being. And so I know it's a crazy process to get there, but listen to how this works. And this is why I thought about sports, because we're surrounded with a cloud of witnesses that have been where we are at right now, and they're cheering us on to get it done just like in sports. Sometimes when you're playing the game and you're getting in there, you're forgetting that there's a whole lot of people on the stands standing right there next to you that have gone that way before, coaching you, cheering you on. And so Hebrews 12 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, who by faith have testified to the truth of God's absolute faithfulness, stripping off every unnecessary weight and the sin which so easily and cleverly entangles us, let us run with endurance the active and active persistence, the race that is set before us. All of a sudden, surrendering becomes something that is not just a philosophy, but it is practical. It's really uncomfortable to run with a whole load of stuff that you're trying to hold on to in your hands. Some of you might be professional and you have a backpack and the whole deal, go for it. Put the backpack on there, but life tends to make it uncomfortable and you just keep on loading on, Right? And so as I thought about this, I was once again reminded of Jacob's wrestle. And as we look at Jacob's wrestle, I brought you the letters of the wrestle. And this is literally what it was like for me, thinking and wrestling through, what is it, Lord God, that you want to have me surrender to you? And so if you're sitting here this morning and you're going, this is so left field. Like, I had no idea that God was going to ask me to surrender anything this morning. I just came to have fun. I didn't have anything else to do this morning, so I thought I'd come to church. And so now you're sitting here and you're going, now you're asking me to do this. I'm not ready. Maybe this will help you. Maybe this will help you unpack 
And maybe, just maybe, you'll be more blessed than what I was. And you can sort this thing out before you leave this morning rather than going through it for weeks like I did because it's grueling. So the W in the word wrestle, Jacob wrestled, right? And the end of the wrestle is him surrendering all the stuff, all the baggage, all the things that was bad and walking out of there with a new name, right? With a new um, level of intimacy and acknowledgement of who God is. And that's what we're aiming for this morning. We're aiming for you to walk out here free and light of all the added on things. So let's go. Work the words. What are the things in you right now? This is practical. This is why I'm trying to get as close as possible to you. Okay, this is practical. What are the things inside of you that are contrary to the word of God over your life? Have you ever even thought about it? What are you living in right now that is contrary to the word of God? Start thinking about that. Work the word of God over you. God has called you to have a blameless character. God has called you to not be a slave to sin, but to be free and stand in righteousness with him. God has called you to not be under the lies and the oppression of the opinion of man, but to live according to what he sees in your identity. Work the words. The R, renew your mind. So if you have learned then that you are now no longer a slave to sin, there is now no longer condemnation, any condemnation for those who are in Christ. You work that word and you go, now I need to start believing it. It's almost like someone who keeps on, and and confession, my husband is like this. I'm giving bad examples of him. I didn't plan this. But he keeps on driving back to the same places, like subconsciously, oftentimes. So he'll be on his way to the office, but he'll drive to school. Why? Because he's so used to driving to school. And that happens in our minds. It neurologically happens in our minds. This is not even spiritual hoo-ha. It's true. It's like your mind gets in a rut. I am terrible at this. I will always struggle with that. Oh, you know, it's just how I am. What are those things? Work the Word of God over your life. And then as you start identifying the things that are contrary to the word of God, then renew your mind. Now, think about things that he would want you to think about. Think about things that are praiseworthy, things that are noble, things that are righteous, things that are true, things that are wise. Come on, I'm preaching the word over you right now. (laughs) Thank you, Chloe. (laughs) Praise the Lord for a brother. (laughs) E is for eternal perspective. As you start thinking about the things that you've held on to, the lies possibly, your identity that's been torted by opinions around you, or maybe you've competed with trying to be like someone else. You're trying to be like someone else rather than trying to be like who he's made you to be. Get rid of that. Surrender that. Renew your mind around it. And then get rid of the things that make your life so busy that it has no eternal value. What are the things in your life that you are working so hard at? You're spending hours and hours at it, but it has absolutely no eternal value. That's what surrender is all about. It's about getting rid of the things that's really not going to help you in the time to come. JP said it so beautifully in the time in between the worship, where he was enlightened and encouraged about not living for just now, but actually aligning ourselves with the eternal reality that is awaiting us. I'm running through these, and I can see that for many of you, you're going, whoa. Take a picture of the screen. Go back to God this week and let him wrestle through this. It's a wrestle. It's a wrestle. And we try and negotiate, and it's okay, because these are things that we've, we've grown so accustomed to that it almost, for me this week, thinking about especially this thing, the things that have eternal value, My schedule is so busy, and somehow, somewhere along the line, I have created this connection in my mind that if I'm busy, then I'm significant. (laughs) What nonsense. If I'm busy with what, then I'm significant. The S is for the significance factor. One thing that I found, living in Africa, ministering in Europe, having family in Europe, and now living in the United States of America, which is my favorite now. (laughs) One thing that I've seen as a similarity across the board, whether I'm speaking to people that are poor 
or really have nothing, or whether I'm speaking to people that are rich and don't know what to do with their money, one thing I have found to be a similar challenge in people's lives, they just really want to make a significant difference. It's not so much about your net worth. It's about, I want to live a significant life. It's the one thing that you can talk about and have the poorest of the poor on the one side of the table and the richest of the rich on the other side of the table, and they can meet each other and they can go, I know what you feel like. We can talk about this. What is your significance being given to? Are you just finding significance in things that is, you know, adding on to yourself? (laughs) Making you look good? At the same time, speaking to so many different groups of people with so many different cultural kind of, you know, experiences and surroundings, I've realized that there's a global phenomenon of depression becoming more and more and more. And the one thing that I've found working with young students as a, in a Bible school when we were still young, <laughs> when we were still young, working with young Bible school students, the one thing that would help young kids get rid of depression like this was for them to realize that as they serve those who need them, they find enough reason to wake up the next morning and live for a reason beyond themselves. If you're looking for your significance factor and you feel like what you do isn't making a big enough difference, then start reaching out to those who need you. Give to the poor. Minister to the needy. Inspire those who are tired and broken down. Find someone that you can mean something to and you'll find your significance factor like this. If you're willing to step out, you'll find significance. I'll stop with the alliteration now. As you wrestle through the areas that you thought was significant and find areas to serve, there might be a tension in the truth, and that's the T. A tension in the truth when the truth dawns on you, push through the tension of the truth, Be faced with it, and then just like Jacob, ask the Lord to bless you. Ask God to come and bless you in it. Because I can tell you this, once you actually accept the truth, Lord, I used to be busy with this. I want to lay this thing down, this ritual, this timing issue that I used to think I was important by loading all these insignificant things into my schedule. I'm going to surrender all of these things back to you. I'm going to ask, Lord, will you show me the truth? Then he starts showing you the truth. Stop doing that. Spend more time with this person. You're investing in this relationship, but that's not a great idea. Let go of this relationship. It's tough. There's a tension. When he starts asking you to stop with things that you really like doing, there's a tension in it. It's tough. And so when the tension of the truth hits you, I just want to encourage you with this and make it a little bit more difficult. The wrestle is all about longevity. (laughs) So don't give too much attention to the tension. That was profound and you missed it. (laughs) Don't give too much attention to the tension because it's not about the tension. It's about the truth. Face the truth and then get so used to it that it becomes a skill. That you actually invite it. You go, Lord, just be honest with me, please. Now, I don't know about you. I'm looking at Ross as I'm preaching this and he's one of the most incredible examples of that. He can tell you the truth without apologizing. And I appreciate it to the moon and back right? And sometimes he gets in trouble (laughs) with other people, not with me. (laughs) But don't you welcome the truth into your life? I don't know. It's like the spinach in your tooth kind of moment, right? It's like, dude, mm -mm. because you can take it. There's nothing in your teeth. There's nothing in your teeth. Well, no, there's nothing in your teeth. (laughs) But wouldn't you embrace that though? rather than sitting around a table and having this piece of something stuck in your mouth and everyone just smiling and, you know, keeping on talking to you while you're looking ridiculous. And so when God comes and he approaches us with truth, there is a tension. There is a feeling of humiliation. There is a a feeling of, oh, I'm humbled by this. I didn't know I had this thing stuck. And I'd been walking around my entire life and people had never shown me that I look ridiculous with something stuck in my teeth. The truth brings tension. But know that it's not going to stop. It's not going to be the last time you have something stuck in your teeth. (laughs) It might happen again. And so as we get used to this, that this, this wrestle 
This is a longevity thing. It's not like you're going to wrestle this one time, you're going to surrender this one big thing, and then it's all going to be over. No, 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 it's a skill. Until the day that we breathe out our last breath on this earth, we'll wrestle. We'll wrestle with the truth. And I pray for you, and I pray for me, that we would become masters at it. That when the Lord challenges us about things that we need to surrender, that we'll say, I'm ready, Lord. That we'll throw down the stuff. That we'll step into the ring and that we'll wrestle. That we'll report for duty and that we'll go, Lord, come on. Show me what this stuff is. Rather than negotiate with his goodness, that we'll just get in the wrestle. And that we'll endure. <laughs> but that we'll embrace the process. That's the E. keep on thinking back of when Ethan was a little boy and he learned to wrestle. It was quite the adventure, I must say. Um, Josh never really took to it, but you can, if you know my boys, you'll know why. The one just is a go-getter and a fighter in it, right? And, and Josh is this kind, oh, just this incredibly kind, but yet powerful guy. And so I remember watching Josh play rugby Standing outside of a scrum, you know what a scrum is? Okay, so elementary school kids, scrumming is a mess. It's basically just a whole lot of kids wrestling for the ball. And I remember standing next to the field and Josh standing next to this wrestling situation, which was supposed to be a scrum, but, you know, standing next to it and going, hey, guys, guys, will you give me the ball, please? <laughs> hey, hey, dude. And I'm standing next to the field. Confession moment. Josh, just grab it! <laughs> how many times, how many times are we negotiating softly and kindly? Oh, idolatry. Oh, adultery. Would you, would you give my life back to me, please? And God is standing on the sideline. We're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses going, can you just get rid of this thing? And then we go, oh, I have to get rid of idolatry. I have to get rid of adultery. I have to get rid of my thoughts. That I love thinking about these thoughts that I suck and I'm terrible and I'm not good enough. Praise the Lord that they've dealt with it. That's why they can laugh. The front section... You have work to do. <laughs> Job says this beautifully in Job 1 verse 20. I just want to remind you of this again. I didn't read the whole scripture. But he was grieving and worshiping at the same time. And that's what happens in the wrestle. <laughs> when we embrace the process, it hurts. It does hurt. It hurts. It's sore. It's humiliating. It literally felt to me in this process of surrender like God was tearing bits and pieces of my soul out of me. Things that I'd grown accustomed to being and loving was torn out of me. And I'm, I'm, I'm no longer this, and I'm no longer that. And it's hard. So let me help you a little bit more. Let me tell you what surrender is not. Surrender is not to subdue to just quiet the problem or to suppress it or just to hold it down. I keep on thinking like when my kids were in the bath and they were trying to hide a, a toy to me, but it kept on popping up, you know. It kind of is like that in our souls. Oh, no, no, I don't have this problem anymore. No, no, I've dealt with it. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I've dealt with it. I don't have this problem anymore. We just push it down. No, I don't have serious hatred and bitterness and anger towards my mom-in-law. I've never had that towards my mom-in-law. Mom, if you're listening, just so you know, never had that before in my life, ever, towards you. That's why I can use the example, because she is laughing out loud right now. But how many times are you just pressing things down that actually exist without acknowledging it and going, okay, I'm no longer going to subdue this emotion. I'm going to head on, surrender it. Go, Lord, I have anger in my heart towards this. I have bitterness. I have unforgiveness. Bring it in the light, Right? Surrender is not to subdue. Surrender is also not to succumb to. Now, those of you who are linguists and very clever at language, to succumb and to surrender is similar. I'm looking at Sarah Joe because she's really clever with language. 
And so I did do my homework. I did go and look. I didn't just go for the, alliter the alliteration in all of these, I promise. But to succumb to and wrestling be between you and God and surrendering things, it's a willful thing. And if you succumb to something, it's a pressure that you can no longer hold, so you just succumb to it, right? When God challenges us to surrender, he doesn't expect us to succumb to it. He's just going to overpower us, and we just better listen because he's the authority. He doesn't do that. He's a good, good father. And oh, is he patient. So it's not a matter of surrendering being succumbing under his power. I, again, think about my children and remember about how Josh was asking for the ball in rugby where Ethan was and still is a monster. You mess with that guy, he gets, he remembers you. <laughs> he did it yesterday. I watched two football games back to back yesterday. He will watch the person that's the biggest threat on that field and you can see him just follow that person. And my, oh my, he cannot, he's not allowed to tackle yet. They're, they only have those flags that they rip, right? They can only like, take the flag right now in football. But I think that in a few years from now, he'll still remember the people that scored against them and he'll tackle them. He'll get it done, right? <laughs> and so when you get to these things, it's not a thing of being tackled by God. It's not a thing of, oh, I remember you have this thing you have to deal with. I'm going to come get you. I'm going to come sort you out. And I remember Ethan getting into that space of negotiating with his bigger brother. And there was a time that it wasn't like Josh was this big and Ethan was yay small. Like now, it's, it was a little bit more equal. And I remember coming into the living room once and Ethan literally sitting on top of Josh saying, I will not let you go. And I don't know how he did it to get his bigger brother to submit or to succumb in that moment. But I want to tell you this morning that God is not sitting on top of you and forcing you to surrender things. He is kindly suggesting surrender to you. It's also not to set aside. Surrender is not to set aside. You might be thinking about that right now. In fact, I think I've, I, I know that there's a couple of us thinking about that. So I have this dream about actually being this kind of person or doing that kind of job, or I have this dream about seeing this happen. And you know what? I'll fulfill this calling that God is giving me right now. I'm just going to set that aside. Surrender is not setting aside. Surrender is, here it is, Lord. Take it, do with it what you want. With no guarantee of you giving it back to me, I surrender it. It's not setting it aside. It's not just pressing pause on it. Surrender is also not to survive I use the S because it's actually just all about, and Casey and I spoke, spoke about that this week, but oftentimes we don't want to give something back to God, so we just hold our breath. I'm just going to survive. I'm just going to hold on until it's over. That's not surrender. It's also not to suppress, and it's also not stupid. Surrender is not stupid. It's not when God comes and he asks you to surrender your calling or your purpose or your destiny or your children or your husband or your relationships or your friendships or what you thought life was going to be. And as he comes and he asks you to surrender this, it's not a stupid just letting go of everything. Oh, I'm just going to leave it all. That's not surrender. Surrender is specific. Surrender is timely. It's significant. And when he comes and he suggests to you what to surrender, there's a list of surrenders. There we go. Look through those. What is he suggesting to you right now to surrender to him? What of those things do you know you need to give back to him? And when we surrender things, it's not always bad things that we have to surrender to him. When we surrender things to him, sometimes it's seemingly really good stuff. Sometimes you've been praying for so long for a person and maybe, just maybe, it's time for you to surrender that back to God and just go, Lord, I'm done. So that he can put someone else in your heart. It's all about us just coming and saying, Lord, I prefer you more than all this stuff. In John 20, from verse 25 to 29, I don't have it on my notes. It's just the place where Thomas asks Jesus, can you actually show me the wounds? Can you show me? Can you show me? 
what happened? And can you show me that you're actually really standing in front of me and you were on the cross? Can you show me where the nails were in? And you know, we all judge him before really thinking about what did Jesus judge him? No. Jesus said, come closer. Let me show you. You want to see it? Let me show you. Let me bring you onto the page where I'm at. And so if you're in a space where you're negotiating these things and you're not sure, take it. Take it to him. Say, Lord, I'm not sure that you have really paid the price for this. I'm not sure that your wounds are actually real in fulfilling what I need to be fulfilled in surrendering this. Go to him. I dare you today. Bring the people. Bring your purpose. Bring the place that you find yourself in. Bring the provision, your money. Bring all of that to him. Say, Lord, I'm going to give it all back to you. And I'll only take up again what you give me in your decision. Why? Not because of this transaction of I surrender, you give me this. But understanding that in a true intimate relationship, it's no longer my problem and Yuri's problem. In a marriage, it's not, oh, this is my problem and this is Yuri's problem. I'm laughing because I just stepped into Yuri's place. I'm Yuri's problem. It's not what I mean. I could be possibly though sometimes. I'm sure I am. But as we think about these things in marriage or in a relationship, Think about it for a second. In marriage and in true intimacy, it's not about my problem and your problem. Girls, think about this in essence with a good father. When you have a problem, it's not your problem and his problem. It's our problem. In a covenant relationship of intimacy, if I have a problem, it's Yuri's problem too. And if Yuri has a problem, it's my problem too. Why? Because I love him and I've chosen that we are one. And So when we think about approaching God, he sees it that way too. It's no longer my problem. It is now our problem, Lord. Isn't it beautiful? Isn't it powerful? Oh, Lord, I have this problem. I'll just deal with it. No. He's going, it's our problem. And when you deal with that problem in the light of who he is, then Galatians 5 Verse 1 becomes so much more real. It was for this freedom that Christ set us free, completely liberating us. Therefore, standing, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery, which you once removed. So once you get rid of the things, the next problem that hits that he says, give it to me, don't go. My problem, your problem. Just give it back to him immediately. Just surrender that yoke, surrender that weight, surrender that thing that you want to carry with you immediately. It is about surrender to get someone front and center. So in my journey um, to South Africa and in journey this, this message, Hillsong released a new album. It's called People. And one of their songs is called As You Find Me. And I was literally in that space where I was going, I have so much to deal with. And I just want to, as I close this message to you this morning, I want to read to you just this couple of lines in the chorus where he says, I've wrestled, I've struggled, I've negotiated, I've tried my best, and yet I feel like I fail. <laughs> so I'm just coming to this place, Lord, and I'm just saying, Lord, will you find me? And then we read this in the lines that close the song. It says, You want my heart, I won't second guess. I'm in, I'm yours. Your love's too good to leave me here. That's the significance of surrender. He wants your heart. He doesn't want the stuff. He doesn't want the purposes. He doesn't want the callings. He's not going to stack it up around his feet. He doesn't need your stuff to make him look better. He wants access to your heart with nothing in between. He's always wanted your heart. He's always wanted him to be the priority. He's always wanted him to be the one that you choose more than holding on to anything or anyone else. You look pretty peaceful. And I 
I'm pretty happy about that. Because in the struggle, in the wrestle, may he always be the one that we keep front and center. (laughs) When we think about these things that we negotiate and wrestle with, when we think about giving it all back to him, may we be so aware that it's because he wants to love us and he wants to make sure that we don't carry stuff that he's already paid for. Yes? Let's pray. Lord, I pray that we'll be mindful that in the surrender, it's about you wanting our hearts and that we will no longer negotiate with the priority of who our hearts belong to or what belongs inside of our hearts. And so I pray, Lord, that this morning as we unpack these things that we've held on to, these people, these purposes, these plans, I pray, Lord, that as we unpack these things, we will live freely and lightly. And that it will always only be about you, about your eternal focus for us, about your showers of love for us, and about a bright future with you in it. And may we one day, Lord, like we said this morning, may we one day, Lord, in righteousness be found. May we one day, inside of who you are, stand faultless before you so that we can step from this earth into eternity with nothing holding back and nothing to be laid down, but freely and lightly enter from this life to the next in our love relationship with you forever. Amen. 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 Thank you, Corinne.